My guest today is Andy Randall. Andy, how are you, sir? I am doing fantastic. Great to be here. I am as well. Um, what do you do for a living? I'm... Yeah, so uh, I'm a, a principal product manager in the Azure organization um, and uh, take care of a few things, but including Linux strategy across Azure Core. And we have a few open source projects and work kind of in the cloud native space. Uh, I always find it interesting when people talk about their Microsoft working on Linux. That would have been unthinkable ten years ago when I first started with this company. It's, yeah. Uh, it, what what it, what brought you to Microsoft as a Linux guy? Yeah, so I was actually working in Berlin, Germany. So I'd, I'd been in the Bay Area, um, California, for like twenty years. Um, decided to move back to Europe and ended up in Berlin, working for a small startup called Kinfolk. And about two and a half years ago, we got acquired by Microsoft. So I came in through that acquisition. Um, and yeah, definitely, um, you know, we were, we were very much a Linux shop and <laughs> there were a few questions among the team about what's it going to mean to come into Microsoft? Is it going to be a welcoming environment for us? Uh, but it's been fantastic. And, um, you know, particularly in, you know, in Azure, right, people think of kind of the heritage of Microsoft and there's definitely a perception that Azure is, you know, a great cloud for Windows and it is, <laughs> but it's, um, you know, it's also a great cloud for Linux. And in fact, you know, today, m the majority of customer workloads running in Azure are running on Linux. So, you know, if we didn't pay a lot of attention, then we wouldn't mm -hmm. be where we are in the cloud business today. Ah, excellent. Now, what is what exactly is your role? Yeah, so, um, so I work across uh, quite a few teams. So one of the, the one of the aspects of Linux is it touches all sorts of different teams from the core platform through to how we work with partners and the community and the uh, marketplace images and provisioning and all different aspects of it. And, um, and so what I try and do is to have all of those teams aligned and to kind of make it all add up to a great Linux uh, user experience. So, you know, if I can give some examples of some things that we've done, uh, maybe you know, some directly with out of my engineering team, some across other engineering teams. Um, but uh, we actually were recently at the Ubuntu Summit and announced a service that we're launching jointly with Canonical uh, for managed Ubuntu snapshots. Now, this is something that is really important for enterprise customers or anyone kind of deploying at scale to be able to have kind of predictable rollouts of uh, updates across their fleet. You know, up to now, uh, Ubuntu would just pull the latest versions of whatever packages and whatever order they came. And you'd have no predictability about exactly what was going to be deployed across your servers. With snapshots, it allows us to say, okay, here's a, a set of um, updates, which are all going to be packaged together. And I can validate them for my workloads and roll them out in a predictable way across the, across the fleet. And that's something that we did in the upstream community to actually in, you know, enhancing the, upstream package management tools um, to enable this, but then work with Canonical to enable that within Azure. So that, you know, that, that's, that's one example of the kind of thing that, um, that we're doing across multiple teams um, with, you know, just to make that Linux experience better. Should uh, I take, go, yes. give some more uh, yeah. examples? <laughs> Well, I, I will come back to it. I just, uh, yeah. I, I'm thinking about uh, the fact that, um, you know, 10 years ago, I mentioned that's, uh, that's when I joined Microsoft. Uh, and it's changed a lot since then. Although this guy Satya seems to get all the credit for it. Uh, yeah, I think he deserves a fair amount of credit. <laughs> <laughs> I know you can't argue correlation, causation, you know. <laughs> uh, exactly. Anyway, the the I, uh, but the prior regime, while they did some things very well, they also were uh, violently anti Linux. Uh, even going so far as to call it a cancer at one point. Uh, and you mentioned that we that that Microsoft is running a lot of workloads in Azure on Linux, most of them all. But I don't know if we knew that ten years ago. Knew that would happen. What, do you know what was uh, as an outsider at the time? What was what's what was the incentive? For Microsoft yeah, to so pursue this course. So I think um, 
I think some of this was actually set in, in motion before Satya, but certainly um, shortly after Satya came in as CEO, he, he made quite a famous uh, speech saying Microsoft loves Linux and it made all of the headlines. Uh, and, you know, we added Linux support into yeah. Azure. And, and, and clearly, um, you know, the, the driver here is that Linux is the OS that powers the cloud, right? It's, um, it's where most open source technologies are built. It's when, you know, all of the at scale consumer kind of services are built on, um, on Linux. So, you know, you, you can't be a cloud company and not have a great Linux experience. So we realized that pretty early on. Um, you know, I think Microsoft is, is nothing if it, if it's not, you know, highly attuned to the needs of developers and the needs of the market. It's how, um, you know, we've, it's how we've survived and, and thrived for, for so long. Um, and, and so, you know, it's, it's been a part of the mission for a long time to make Azure a great platform uh, for Linux. You know, we have, if you go back, um, you know, 10 years ago, over, over the, you know, over the last decade, you'll see us doing a lot of work in the, in the Linux kernel to ensure that upstream Linux kernel is supporting Azure um, platform really well. Um, you know, and, and you see us, um, you know, working with the vendors, we have really close partnerships with Canonical, with Red Hat, with SUSE, with Oracle, all, all of the, um, you know, all of the vendors, but also all, all the communities building, um, building Linux. So, yeah, it's, it's definitely, yeah. I guess, historic, from a historical perspective, it's quite a turnaround, but, you know, we've been, uh, in major it's been the majority of workloads in, in Azure for quite a few years now. And, you know, it's, um, you yeah. know, it's definitely what the customers are looking for. Uh, and I, I think Microsoft actually has its own distribution of Linux, isn't that right? Yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, so this is an interesting one. So we uh, we actually f a few years back now looked at our own internal usage of Linux because um, you know this is maybe not so well known. Obviously, people understand as a cloud platform, a lot of the customer workloads are running Linux, but even internally, Microsoft. Uh, you know, embraces Linux in for a lot of applications. Uh, a lot of our own internal workloads run on a variety of different Linux distros, and we became, um, you know, a, a, we, we realized that this was actually a challenge for us in terms of being able to enforce security and consistency across uh, across all of our first party services. So, um, decision was taken a few, a few years ago to build our own Linux distribution to um, provide that control um, and uh, over the security of, of and consistency of the platform for those services. And in fact, it's it's even been made available now to third party users as part of the AKS service. So if you're using Azure Kubernetes service, uh, you can choose whether to make your nodes run on Ubuntu or run Azure Linux. And, you know, Azure Linux has a lot of advantages. You get all of the same kind of security controls that we're applying ourselves internally. And it's also optimized for containers. So it's a much smaller, uh, lighter weight uh, distribution than, uh, than Ubuntu. So mm. uh, a lot of, a lot of AKS users are, are navigating uh, towards that. But I think the key thing I, I want to say is, um, you know, Azure Linux is very important to us, but it all's, all does, also doesn't take away from the fact that we're working closely with all of those partners that I talked about uh, because Linux is a, uh, you know, is a, is a large and varied ecosystem and users are going to have their own choices about what, which distributions they want to use. And we want to make Azure a great place to run Linux, you know, whatever flavor you choose, whatever, um, you know, whatever's right for your workloads. Um, we want to enable that and hence why we're working so closely with the community and, uh, and the partners. Uh, tell me a little about your, the, how that relationship works between your team and folks like Red Hat, uh, or, you know, people that are maintaining these distributions of Linux. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it actually goes across multiple teams. So we have, um, you know, we have a partner engineering team that has very close engineering relationships with each of the vendors. Um, we have obviously our global partnerships team that manage the business relationships with the vendors. Um, and then we have the, uh, the marketplace and kind of business enablement side of it, where, uh, customers can go into the marketplace, choose their distribution, 
some some of those are free, some of those are paid. Where they're you know paid like Red Hat Enterprise Linux, um, you know, there we offer a lot of flexibility in terms of licensing. And in fact, that's one of the uh, you know one of the unique things we have within Azure: the, the flexibility of how we enable those partners to um, to license within Azure is is I think um, pretty much unique. So we have a, um, a capability called Azure Hybrid Benefit, where if you have um, you know licenses on prem, say you can move those into Azure and switch them to pay as you go model, or switch them to a you know, to a Red Hat Direct model and it kind of can move those license capabilities uh, in a in a very um, flexible way. So so that's that makes it super um, attractive to both to the end users, but also to um, to the partners. And, and you know, in many cases, we're, um, you know, we're the first line of support. So we have joined up support uh, agreements with, for example, Red Hat, where if you deploy um, RHEL within Azure, uh, you have any kind of issue there, you can call up Microsoft support. They'll take, you know, they'll take the case, handle it on the back end, work with Red Hat if they need to. And that's the only interface you need. Or you can go raise it with Red Hat and they'll talk to Microsoft. Um, you know, it's it's really a joined up support experience. So those are, um, you know, really important for some of the larger customers to be able to have that, um, uh, you know, single touch point. Excellent. Everybody wins. Yeah, uh, exactly. And on a, a lot of these Linux distributions are are they're built on open source. I mean, obviously, there's some commercial products, or commercial offerings of them. Is is Microsoft contributing to these open source distributions? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, the Ubuntu snapshots um, update was an, was an example of that. That went straight into um, you know, the Debian package management tool, uh, APT. Uh, we have uh, actually some of the leading Linux engineers and you know, on the planet working within Microsoft, uh, enhancing Linux kernel, uh, folks like uh, Kay Weissner and Vassen in the our Linux engineering team is very well known in the kernel space. We have Leonard Puttering, who is the uh, um, uh, founder and maintainer of System D, really core cool component in um, in Linux distros today. And, um, you know, we're contributing to uh, things like cloud in it. So cloud in it is a key component, which enables Linux to be provisioned within cloud environments. Um, I was actually in Redmond recently. We hosted the Cloud Init Summit. All of the vendors were there, all the core maintainers, um, you know, talking about the future of the project. So, yeah, I mean, we're very active in those upstream communities um, and very active, you know, pushing forward the state of the art of, of Linux today. Very cool. Uh, I understand uh, your team is also contributing to other open source projects, correct? Yeah, yeah. So um, generally, kind of Linux-related projects, but not necessarily, um, you know, part of Linux itself. So we have a really cool sure. project, which actually you and I just met at, at KubeCon last week, and we had a project booth there. That was good uh, yeah. for a couple of a couple of our projects, um, and uh, you know, both of those now are in the CNCF, um, so the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Uh, one inspector gadget it's called um inspector with a k to show it's for kubernetes i love the name <laughs> is ah. um it's it's really kind of taking uh, the capabilities of ebpf which is a new linux kernel technology that's getting very wide adoption but still quite hard to use and allowing you to package up um uh, ebpf programs with some user space processing um into a gadget that can be published uh, and we have a bunch of off-the-shelf uh, gadgets as well for things like inspecting um, what you know what syscalls a container is making or are being made on a host, or inspecting you know input-output activity, CPU consumption. Really, kind of these kind of micro observability tools that get low down into the system and translating them into kind of usable insights that um, help people really um, diagnose is issues that are either at the container level or at the host level or, you know, um, uh, kind of wherever it, it makes sense to um, to be getting the, the, this data out. Um, second project is called Headlamp, and that's a, um, okay. uh, it's, again, all of these are open source. It's a, it's a user interface for Kubernetes, so it's extensible. Uh, we have a number of users actually developing plugins for it. 
Uh, and in fact, it's being used quite extensively internally. So internally, we have um, a number of teams that use AKS as their Kubernetes platform, and they're using Headlamp as a uh, as a portal for that. And it, it can be deployed both as a desktop application and as a kind of a web UI. So that's um, so that's pretty cool. We're pretty excited about that. And then and then lastly, we have that's another cool. Linux distro called Flatcar Container Linux, um, and that came out of um, hmm. uh, the team I, I came into Microsoft with, Kinfolk, uh, which is um, very much focused just on the container host um, application, and um, uh, and is community driven. So the idea here is it it runs in any platform. Uh, you know, runs across all the clouds. It's actually a derivative of an OS called Core OS, um, which was started very in the very early days of the container, um, uh, you know, of the container journey. And uh, it's it's being used at scale by a lot of um, a lot of end users across a lot of different environments. And we're in the process of uh, transitioning that into the CNCF as well. So, um, you know, th these are again kind of what we're doing to drive the community forward and um, enable these open source projects via, uh, you know, community governance uh, kind of approach. Very cool. I, I imagine the Flatcar container Linux has, uh, it has tools in it to, you know, support containers, but it probably leaves out uh, a lot of other stuff that isn't necessary to make it lighter weight. Yeah, exactly. So there's a few... Yeah, there's there's a few kind of key uh, things to it. So one one is exactly that, but it's really stripped down to just what you need to run containers because containers include all of their dependencies that they that they need. You don't need the package in the host OS. Um, another is it's immutable, so you can't you you literally cannot change the OS um, the main OS installation partition because that whole partition is marked as a read only. So this actually derives from um, Chrome OS. It was originally um, uh, developed by you know by Google for the for managing large fleets of desktops, but it works for servers as well. So you have a, an update mechanism where you install a new version into a new partition, and it just flips from one partition to the next. And if the update doesn't work, you flip back. So it kind of makes it really modular and easy to um, manage at scale. We're we're also collaborating with Google as well. It's a new world. Yeah. Well, there's, there's a lot of, I mean, that's one of the things of being active in Linux and open source is you, know, you, you have to collaborate with everyone out there, right? It's, um, you know, we're all working together to improve the state of the art and technology. We, we compete on a lot of areas <laughs> and, and that's just right. attention you've got to be comfortable with if you're, if you're going to play in the open source space. Coopetition, I call it. Exactly. Uh, well, well, this is this is a really good overview of the things that Microsoft is doing on Linux. Is there any key points that you feel that we should have talked about that we've missed? Um, I think the um, probably one point that I'd like I'd like to add as well is just what we're doing to to drive quality within Azure. Um, you know, we've one of the big pushes for us has been improving um, the uh, quality assurance processes around. Uh, update testing. Um, we have these things called extensions. So if you use Azure services, then um, sometimes they need code installing in the guest itself. And so that's deployed via an extension. So we've been implementing kind of consistent QA for all of those pieces. And, you know, and we've definitely seen, um, you know, we've, we've seen improvements in the experience. And I see that uh, you know, reflected in what we're hearing from customers, and uh, you know, I'm I'm pretty pretty excited about where where we're going um, with this and how we're improving the experience. So, yeah, uh, hopefully that it it kind of all adds I'm up to as well. we we have you know Microsoft is 100% committed to you know, to Linux and to making Azure you know the best cloud for running Linux. Awesome. We're just about at time, so. Uh, Andy, I know it's later in the day for you in Germany than it is for me in Chicago, and I really appreciate your time. Oh, good. Thank you, David. Appreciate the opportunity to come on and talk about what we're doing. As we mentioned, uh, David and I got to know each other last week at KubeCon. 
And the great thing I love about being at KubeCon was to meet so many friends that I've had in the technology space and also to make new friends. I didn't know David before. Now he's one of my friends and uh, it's been a fantastic experience. Really appreciate it.